Hello, and welcome to this presentation on From Personal Data to Digital Legacy, Exploring Conflicts in the Sharing, Security, and Privacy of Postmortem Data. My name is Jack Holt from Newcastle University, and this paper was co-authored with James Nicholson from Northumbria University and Jan Smedink, also of Newcastle University. This paper is situated in an intersection between the privacy of personal data, the ways in which that data is kept secure, and the concept of digital legacy. That is to say, the forms of data or digital footprint that remain of an individual after they have died. The main elements of the research focus on the core individual values and behaviors relating to these three concepts and the ways in which they may interact or conflict with one another. Our paper describes a small scale qualitative study in which we consider digital legacy planning on a granular level, the privacy decisions that are involved and the ways in which it may restrict and be restricted by strong security practices. Throughout this paper and this short presentation, the terms digital legacy and postmortem privacy will feature regularly, and so it's worth giving a short overview of each. First, digital legacy. As I mentioned a moment ago, this is a broad term that relates to the digital remains of a person after they have died. Depending on the context in which it's being discussed, topics relating to digital legacy can include, but are not limited to, the creation of online memorials, plans for the persistence, maintenance, or removal of a person's social media, access to important or meaningful files and documents, and distribution of financially valuable digital assets such as cryptocurrency. For our study, any and all imagined forms of digital legacy can be considered relevant. However, our study design focuses in particular on elements that are known to the individual and kept actively secure during life. The second term that we wish to clarify is postmortem privacy. This term relates to the concept that personal privacy maintains value after the individual concerned has died. That is to say, an individual may have preferences during life that relate to how their privacy is handled after death, and that it is possible to breach the privacy of a deceased individual. We acknowledge that individual beliefs about what is right and wrong in this respect will vary widely. However, we argue that for a proportion of the population, a degree of postmortem privacy is expected, and many have preferences relating to how they are remembered. For a helpful definition of this term, we include the following description of postmodern privacy from Edwards and Harbinia, who describe the right of postmodern privacy as the right of a person to preserve and control what becomes of his or her reputation, dignity, integrity, secrets, or memory after death. These two terms are founded on the concept that some people consider what happens after they die to be important. However, what it is that should happen is not consistent across the population, and conflicts can arise when we examine the detail of what ideally should take place after death and how it should be executed. A recent survey of technology users illustrated these individual differences. When asked whether access should be granted after death to personal email, social networking and cloud storage accounts, opinions were split, with 45% to 50% indicating a preference for someone to have full access. 31% to 36% expressing that all access should be denied, and approximately 20% showing a preference for some degree of partial access. Such evidence promotes the conclusion that it is difficult to predict the appropriate course of action for such entities when an individual passes away, and any such actions require the deceased to have engaged in some level of planning or communication of their preferences prior to their death. Assuming that an individual has expressed their wishes in a comprehensive way, Carrying out these wishes may be complex or even impossible. By their nature, most of the elements that make up a person's digital life are dematerialized. That is to say, they do not have a tangible presence or defined location in the world. This means that some elements, intentionally or not, may not be known to the loved ones of the individual and may be overlooked. In some cases, this may align well with the postmortem privacy intentions of the individual. In others, it may result in meaningful online identities, files, and data being lost forever. A further barrier to appropriate digital legacy actions is the difficulty associated with transferring data and account access privileges. The precise nature of these difficulties depends on the digital entity in question and the behaviors of the individual. However, many companies require users to sign up to terms of service that do not allow the transfer of accounts and will typically resist efforts from next of kin through legal channels to access data that they hold relating to a deceased user. Notable attempts to manage these problems have come from Google and Facebook, and a number of smaller technology ventures have arisen that aim to develop bespoke digital legacy solutions. Google in 2013 developed the Google Inactive Account Manager, 
which operates on a form of the dead man's switch. This means that accounts that have set up the inactive account manager that have been inactive for a given amount of time will ultimately trigger some predefined steps, potentially resulting in the sharing of specific parts of the user's Google data with named individuals. Facebook introduced in 2015 a legacy contact setting in which a named individual can be set up to have partial control over a person's Facebook profile after they have died. Many other tech ventures exist, offering different functionalities relating to digital legacy, including the curation and storage of meaningful data, scheduled messages, memorials, and even avatars and chatbots representing the deceased. However, many such ventures fail to require enough usage to be able to stand the test of time. Our paper is based on users of an existing technology that also sometimes offers functionality supporting digital legacy, password managers. Password managers are a modern tool that can be used to promote good online security habits, making the creation and continued usage of unique and strong passwords much easier and more convenient. A consequence of their role in collecting and storing account credentials is that password managers possess arguably the strongest overall picture of a person's digital life. Some password managers feature functionality for the automatic transfer of this data in the event of an emergency, in which named individuals are assigned as recipients and may access the password vault, subject to a variant of the dead man's switch mechanism described earlier. Our study sought to consider a simplified digital legacy planning process by which individual plans were formed for specific types of files, data, and online services. Over two workshops, held with participants who used password managers, we used a turn-based card task to facilitate in-depth discussion about how certain digital legacies should be handled after death. In this task, the participant whose turn it was to draw a card drew and announced the digital entity card to the group. The group was then asked to consider the most suitable future of this digital entity after death, and collectively place it under one of three categories, plan, hide, or ignore. In order to encourage equal contribution, the person who drew the card had final say on this decision. As they were doing this, our participants debated the potential actions and were invited to annotate the card. The resulting conversational data was analyzed using thematic analysis, and we provide results in two sections. The first includes themes derived from the discussion, and the second highlights some individual elements and barriers that arose during the tasks. It is important to be clear about our methodology and its strengths and limitations. Firstly, our sample is small and focused. We targeted password managers, a group that is not generalizable to the population. We further conducted only two workshops, each with seven participants for a total of 14 participants. It is not our intention that our data or analysis are interpreted as representative of any population or that the issues and themes that emerge from the data are considered to be exhaustive. Instead, this research should be considered as a formative investigation into granular digital legacy decision-making, focusing on a targeted sample of users of password managers, a form of technology that we consider to be among the most effective means of securely transferring passwords after death presently available. Our analysis describes three themes and a range of digital legacy design considerations. For this talk, I will highlight one theme and a section of the design considerations. Those interested in the remainder, I will encourage to read the paper, which expresses these with more detail and clarity than I can achieve within the confines of this talk. The theme that I will discuss in this talk is death as a privacy transition point. This topic arose frequently during the discussions, as participants often sought to establish a baseline privacy level for the digital entities. In doing so, they typically began the discussion with an assessment of how inherently private that data or account is during life. This is summarized here by one participant. If you look at your email account right now, you would assume that nobody else except you is able to access it. So why would that change after your death? In this case, this is an assumption, but not a strongly held conviction. This same participant later suggested that the email account should be made accessible to a trusted individual. In other cases, opinions are stronger. Another participant remarks that, for me, anything I've made public is what I want to be public. Anything that's not public, I'm keeping behind closed doors for a good reason. In this case, we can see a conviction that privacy has continued importance after death and should be treated exactly the same in death as it was in life. Participants also highlight that continued privacy cannot be taken as a given. They identify that security standards and measures will continue to change and progress while their private data continues to be protected by the standards and mechanisms that existed during their lifetime. 
making them outdated over time and increasingly vulnerable to unauthorized access. They also identify that it is possible that data will be accessed from online services via legal channels. In the event that a person chooses to selectively share private data, one participant notes that one's own security habits become redundant in favor of the security habits of the recipient. In their case, data that was protected during life by unique randomly generated passwords might end up secured by much weaker reused passwords if passed to someone else upon death. In other cases, participants argued that a change in privacy after death could be beneficial. Data that is restricted from public view during life is not necessarily intended to be restricted indefinitely. The privacy decision made during life may only represent the desired privacy at that moment. However, in cases where people die unexpectedly, those seemingly small in the moment privacy decisions may inadvertently result in data being inaccessible to friends and family forever. At the same time, the inverse may be true. Some service users begrudgingly trade their personal data for access to a service during life. When they die, access to the service becomes no longer relevant, yet the data that was shared may continue to be stored and used by the service for years to come. One participant voices a desire to have Google location data deleted after death, but comes from a slight unease about it existing in the first place. Although our participants were primed to discuss password managers, many of the possibilities and solutions suggested involved other mechanisms, including proactive data sharing, automated deletion, the use of email, bespoke technology solutions like Facebook legacy contact and Google inactive account manager, and the potential use of opt-out legal defaults. However, password managers were discussed in depth, and for this abridged version, I will focus on four specific problems that were identified and how password managers might be used in digital legacy planning. Firstly, we identify that password managers that feature functionality for transferring access to a password vault, often referred to as emergency contact functionality, need to feature granularity. Although this functionality varies across password managers, with the majority not having such a function at all, those that offer it tend to do so in such a way that the entire password vault is transferred. We argue that there is significant scope for password managers to allow granular control over who gains access of which credentials, as well as the timing and manner in which these transfers take place. Secondly, we identify a need for review. Post-mortem data access decisions have the potential to be deeply impactful for grieving loved ones. And just as with traditional estate planning, the transfer of access to the wrong person or of the wrong content has the potential to be damaging and distressing. However, we also identify that not everyone wishes to be confronted with mortality on a regular basis. And so password managers that offer such functionality have a design opportunity to promote appropriate review and updating of the credentials that may be transferred. Thirdly, unlike traditional estate planning, the use of password managers for digital legacy planning is not supported by law, and there can be no official transfer of access to data in this way. This means that having access to a password does not mean having access to the account or to the data if the service provider closes or memorializes the account. A consequence of this for password managers is that it is possible to have multiple password managers with separate conflicting legacy plans and neither can be claimed to contain the true intent of the user. Finally, passwords are not the only existing security mechanism. Many services utilize multi-factor authentication meaning that the recipient may require access to a second factor, for example, a mobile phone, in order to access certain accounts. Password managers that offer emergency contact functionality may need to consider how two-factor authentication backup codes can be built into their design of this functionality. To summarize, our paper looks at digital legacy decision-making for users of password managers. We identify conflicts that can arise for individuals who exhibit strong security behaviors, and outline the potential that web tools such as password managers have in designing solutions for this problem. Our findings are an early and formative stage of a larger research journey exploring how web technologies can be designed to lessen conflicts between privacy, security, and digital legacy planning. That brings us to the end of the talk. I hope you found this interesting. If you have, please consider checking out the paper, which contains much more detail. Thanks for watching.